Okay, welcome to Growing Tech with Greg Williamson and Owen Scott. Uh, today we're privileged to have Nio Parker. Nio's got an amazing career. Um, she's had roles in customer success, strategy, operations, and product management. Um, what we're going to cover today is we're going to dig into how you got into the B2B tech sector, and then we're going to learn, try and understand some of the key challenges that you see uh, working with tech companies. Perfect. Thank you so much for having me. Pleasure. Great. I'll, I'll kick off, Naya. Um, again, thanks, thanks for coming along. Great to have you here. Um, first, just be interesting to get a bit of a, uh, if you could run us through your background a little bit, because you've got some fascinating experience, both you know, education-wise, but also you, you've had stints with companies like Google and Visa and Salesforce. Um, just give us a bit of a rundown on, on, on how you got there and um, some of your sort of highlights from, from those gigs. All right. Well, I started off my career in consulting, um, coming out of a master's degree at St. Andrews. I worked for the corporate executive board, which was a strategic research firm in Washington, D.C. And during that, uh, my time at the company, I ended up working with the heads of investor relations and CFOs at over half the Fortune 500 companies. And so mm. that was a really great experience mm. for me because I was in my early 20s. I didn't know the difference between a 10K versus a 10Q when I started. And by the end of it, I had to be an expert on everything uh, related to investor relations, going to the market, equity raises, um, investors, mm. et cetera. Um, after my time at Corporate Executive Board, I went to business school at Northwestern University at Kellogg School of Management. And so I majored in finance, marketing, and strategy, and did my internship at McKinsey. Decided wow. really, really quickly that I did not want to go back into strategy consulting, mm. um, let alone living in hotels every night of the week. <laughs> and uh, so after, um, after my time there, I went to Google. Google had actually been one of my clients when I was at Corporate Executive Board. And so I went into product management there. I was working on their AdWords Express product, which was their SMB advertising for brick and mortar. And so the challenge that Google had was they had done a phenomenal job in terms of locking up all the advertising for you know, large online companies. But there was this huge long trail um, that they just had an atrocious track record with. And so mm -hmm. effectively what we did was we built a product where we could automate that process. So we could write all the advertising text for these companies. Um, we could link it to Google Places uh, listings so they didn't even have to have a website. Mm -hmm. We tried to make it as seamless and as easy as possible. And during my time there, we actually were able to grow the business um, over 100% year over year. Uh, we had um, phenomenal growth um, in international markets, so into Indonesia, Brazil, um, a lot of non, um, other non-English speaking markets. Uh, from there, I got recruited to go work at Visa. Um, so I was the head of product strategy and the chief of staff for the Global Information Products Group. And so Visa had a really interesting business model where you have the core transaction business, but coming out of that transaction business, you had one of the world's best data sets. We had about 70% mm -hmm. of the world's uh, yeah. transaction yeah. data going through our oh, network. Wow. And so my group owned that data. So mm. we had all the fraud risk authentication products. Uh, we had all the marketing analytics applications mm. of those products. We had the customer loyalty. And then we also had the business intelligence products. The challenge we had though was a lot of these products were pretty obsolete and looked like something out of like early 1990s with the black screens and you know early Java. And so a lot of what I was responsible for doing was going through and doing a portfolio rationalization, figuring out which products we were going to actually invest in, which ones we were going to end of life, and what were the other products that we needed to develop mm. in large part to really drive a lot more of that product stickiness for staying with the Visa network and mm. keeping the card portfolios and expanding the card portfolios. From there, I went and worked at Salesforce, and so as the Director of Strategy and Operations for the Customer Success Organization. And so when I joined Salesforce, we had a really interesting inflection point because historically we had been focused on SMBs, and all of a sudden we were moving more into this enterprise space. Mm. And our customer base was growing 30% year over year. Um, and then the other challenge we had though was our CS headcount was only growing 4% year over year. And so a lot of what I was working on with my team was how do we fundamentally redefine what our customer engagement model was? And how did standard versus premier versus premier plus versus mission critical 
um, what did that look like for our mm. customers and how do we differentiate yeah. all those customer journeys and who got dedicated account management, who got more of that reactive um, automated account management. And um, also how do we build out our services business because that was a huge opportunity, but we also had a really strong partner ecosystem and so being a lot more objective in terms of which were the companies that we actually did the implementations or the upgrades mm. for versus which were the ones that went to our implementation partners. I did that for several years, and then I went to a unicorn startup in the SaaS space, and I was the director of strategy and operations for their services division. And so the challenge Intap had was uh, we had a huge customer base. We were actually losing money off of our services business, and mm. both of you being um, very intimately familiar with services implementations. Mm. Um, it's pretty much impossible to lose money off a service implementation team if you are running the business correctly. And mm. so I did that for a year in terms of re-engineering what our engagements look like, what our billing rates look like, um, resetting our target utilization, and ensuring that we have sufficient work for where our staffing and where our customer base was located. I yeah. ended up taking several years off um, to raise my daughter, and then I went and joined an Australian startup for a year um, in the marketing space and so as the head of customer success and so they historically hadn't had anyone in the customer success function and they had a really passive engagement model and so a lot of my work was focused more on building out um, a much more robust support model, um, account management model and actually driving more of that long-term relationship mm -hmm. with the customers so we could drive the repeat revenue for the business. And I'm currently on a break and uh, figuring out what's next. Awesome. Cool. Hey, thanks for that. That's amazing. And um, and you've made your way back to New Zealand. So I have. Cool. <laughs> I, courtesy of COVID, it happened a lot faster than we've been planning on. So we're very, very fortunate to be able to be here. Now, so I suppose in a lot of those roles, you mentioned customer success. Mm -hmm. um, so how would you define what customer success means in the, in the context of a tech company, a B2B tech company? In a B2B tech company, my definition of customer success is frankly, everything that happens after sales. As soon as the salesperson has closed the deal, everything that needs to happen with that account and with that customer happens in the customer success team. So customer onboarding, implementation, ongoing relationship, support services if required, and then ultimately renewal. So the customer success function is ultimately responsible for ensuring that customer gets everything that they need to out of that relationship so that they're going to continue spending money indefinitely yeah. with the business. Cool. And in terms of that, you know, in a context of a sort of a Kiwi tech company uh -huh. looking to measure or monitor customer success, what do you think are some of the key data points they should be looking at? Uh, so in terms of data points, there are quite a lot of them. Yeah. And so effectively, you want to break it out into the different phases of the customer success. So if you're focusing more on just the sheer revenue aspect, you mm. want to look at like what what is your global revenue? What is your actual net income once you've deducted all of your expenses? What are the month on month and year over year trends that you're seeing? Is your revenue expanding? Is it contracting? Is mm. it highly cyclical? Do you have people only signing up for three months or are they signing up for five year um, contracts and continuing to renew? Um, you want to look at your attrition and churn because that is absolutely essential because I think a lot of companies do a fantastic job of bringing in new customers. Um, very often where you see companies failing is that retention aspect of it. And yeah. so if you've spent a lot of money bringing in these companies to your business and most of them are trading out of your product before you've hit that break even point, let alone the net mm. positive revenue, why are you in business? Ultimately, you're going to churn through so many customers that there's going to be no customers left for you to address. Do you think, and do you think people underestimate the the importance of it or the the complexity of that whole? I think they completely underestimate it. Yeah. I, I think it's one of those things where companies are so focused on growing the overall business, yeah. mm. it's really hard for people to sit back and objectively say, okay, like, what am I doing? Mm. And where is their opportunity for growth? Because you know, when you're constantly growing and you're you know fighting for additional investments, and there's so many things that can be done, you know, oftentimes it's that squeaky wheel 
that mm. people focus on of like, oh, my biggest account has said that they're not gonna renew. So all the resources go there. Well, what about the other 100 customers that are up for renewal at the yeah. same time? Mm. Who's actually talking to them? Who's maintaining those relationships with them? Who's making sure that everything is going all right? And that when I send them that renewal paperwork, that they are in fact gonna renew. Yeah. Um, and I think that's part of the challenges. I think people underestimate how much proactive outreach it actually takes to yes. ensure that yeah. these companies are healthy and that they're feeling like they're top of mind for you. And it's one of those things, it doesn't always have to be somebody directly mm. calling them or having a meeting with them every month or every quarter. Um, a lot of it can be through automation and building out what mm. that customer journey is and doing one, more of that one-to-many. But it requires a lot of um, a strategic uh, foresight to be able to sit back and do that mm. and to really understand that you know oftentimes a lot of the things you try are not going to be great other things are going to be fantastic and sometimes the things that end up working the most are the ones where you know it was a throwaway idea that very little effort thought went into and all of a sudden you know everyone was super happy like you know one of one of the things that I remember from my time at Google was we were dealing with something like 60, 70 percent year over year attrition. And mm. one of the things we found out by talking to our customers, we weren't sending the monthly statements. They literally just wanted a monthly statement. Tell me how you're spending my money. Yeah. Like how many clicks did I get? How many views did mm. I get? How many phone calls? We implemented that one change. It ended up being the most open to email in Google's yeah. history. Wow. I think we had something like 70, 80 percent open rate just by sending them a simple monthly statement. Mm. And that act in and of itself helped us really turn around the attrition number because they could actually start quantifying, this is the impact of advertising on my business. Mm. Yep. So, Just you mentioned about the squeaky wheel and the customer sort of demanding customers. So how, how do you balance that sort of customer needs versus business goals that you want to achieve? That, that is um, the million dollar question that I think very few companies um, successfully crack. And a part of it is um, invariably a squeaky wheel, depending on how, how persistent they are, can, can cause a lot of problems across the board. Um, so what you want to do is you want to set a very consistent model of this is what I'm willing to do for a customer. Mm. If they have paid a $50,000, $100,000 price tag for the product. This is what they get for fifty to 100000 Here's the incremental that I'm willing to do above and beyond that. But at some point, you have to make that determination as to whether or not that customer is worth keeping. And so, um, and, and sometimes the right answer is to actually fire the customer. Like, it, mm. you, you never want to have to do that, but sometimes that is the right customer, or right customer and right co company decision. So for instance, when I was at Corporate Executive Board, we had the sales team sell General Motors as one of our clients. And when General Motors became my client, I was told, you have to do everything that GM tells you because it's absolutely essential. It's a huge logo. It's really important for you to keep this logo. And what came out of my conversations was that what had been promised to General Motors was the equivalent of a multi-million dollar McKinsey engagement, so a two, three million dollar price tag. Hmm. They were paying me five figures. There was no way that I could actually deliver what had been promised hmm. with the resources that I had unless I was willing to alienate over 300 other customers in the process. And so I made the determination, which was not popular at the time, to fire GM as a client. And I got called into my boss's boss's office for like, why did you do this? And I had to walk through my business rationale of like, do you want the revenue from this one company? Or do you want me to sacrifice the revenue from all these other companies? Because here's everything else that mm. I and my team cannot do if we're actually gonna do what you want us to do for this yeah, client. Awesome. And so um, a lot of it is just setting realistic expectations. Mm. And you have to be comfortable with attrition where it's warranted. It's one thing if you completely drop the ball and you haven't done what you said you were going to do for the company. It's another thing where if you've delivered contractually everything that was agreed to and then more, if they ultimately don't renew, some, sometimes that happens. Yeah. And you yeah. have to be willing to accept that. Yeah. Yeah, no, cool. Um, and in terms of that customer success process, you talked defined it as sort of everything post the sale. Yeah. Uh, the deal's closed one and then there's a whole lot of stuff mm -hmm. um, and it's quite a complex interaction Extremely often. Complex. 
So how does um, technology play a role, do you think, in managing that process? Technology is absolutely essential because mm. I think the challenge you have is a lot of companies' inclination is to throw bodies at the problem, and the problem is there's if you're having to add headcount linearly with every single customer acquisition, you're just never going to see economies of scale. Yeah. And the other thing, too, is you really want to train the customers how to best interact with you. And so if you have the right technology stack, so you know typically you need some type of CRM system, so whether it be Salesforce or HubSpot or you know hmm. the, the, the plethora of other players that are on the market, but then you also want CS-specific products um, hmm. that provide more of that customer journey so that you can automate the emails, so that you can do the automatic assignment of territories, so that you can build in the metrics within each of the portfolios for how you want those portfolios to behave. And what you want to do is to effectively automate as much of the customer experience as possible, so that when customers are varying from what their expected behavior is, mm. that's when you can rely more on that manual intervention yeah. and you know leverage a lot of those resources for it. The other thing too is a lot of customers are just too small for you to actually service them mm. with the body yeah. for it to be financially viable. You know, if somebody's only spending five thousand dollars a year with you, but they require fifty hours of time, there's there's no way you're gonna make mm. any money off of it. And so everything that you can do to leverage technology and create as standardized of an experience as possible, especially more for those S and B customers. Um, that's going to save you so much time and resources later on so you can focus on your high value customers or your red account customers um, or ones where you know you may have the potential to grow the relationship 510x. Um, so can you tell us about you've got a new role at BNC Advisory? Can you tell us a bit about the role and about the company itself? Yes so I um, have been asked um, on a number of occasions to do um, consulting work. And so I set up a consulting firm during COVID and uh, I've done consulting for SMBs, both in the US and in New Zealand. And so a lot of it is companies that are figuring out what their customer success strategy is going okay. to be. And um, they may be relatively early stage, they may not necessarily have the money to hire a full-time customer success person, or they may be figuring out ultimately what does that organization uh, need to look like going forward. Cool. And what, what about, um, you know, obviously you're bringing a lot of your experience in the tech industry to that to those kind of gigs, which is cool. Mm -hmm. um, but it'd be interesting, you know, your observations, you've moved from sort of the global headquarters of tech yeah. uh, and worked for some of the biggest brands in tech. Mm -hmm. And you now you've been in New Zealand for a couple of years uh, mm -hmm. you've inter and you work for an Australian company, you probably interact with a bunch of companies. What, what are your sort of observations of the tech sector here, you know, right on the sort of here on the edge of the world? Uh -huh. First and foremost, I think New Zealand has some fantastic tech companies that are headquartered mm. here. Uh, I think the biggest challenge that I see for the tech companies here is how do you build that global visibility and awareness of who is actually operating here and just how impressive a lot of these products and the offerings are. Um, I think New Zealand companies invariably seem to focus more on the New Zealand Australia market versus more of that global uh, market. Mm. And so I think there's a lot of opportunity in terms of better marketing themselves um, on the global arena, um, doing a much better job in terms of pitching what exactly it is that they do and the benefit that they provide. Um, I've seen a number of websites that could, could benefit from um, some professional marketing. Uh, I think yeah, the biggest thing facing the New Zealand market, um, frankly, is the funding constraints um, that mm. the New Zealand market presents. There is some PEVC money available, but it's nowhere near the level of scope that's available in other markets. And so I think that's also one of the challenges is, you know, how do we ensure that New Zealand companies are getting access to the capital that they need to in order to really expand and scale up their operations, uh, especially when there's very limited time frames for yeah. a lot of the spaces that we're competing in. So if you only have a one to three year window before mm. somebody is going to yeah. be the 800 pound gorilla in that space, you need to be able to scale up your sales operations, your customer success, your product team. Um, and your international presence to be able to support those customers. And that requires quite a lot of capital and that's not really readily available in this market. Yeah. And so do you think, well, do, do, 
tech companies need to look offshore more for for funding or I, I think they definitely do I, mm. I think you know part of the challenge with New Zealand and Australia is they're relatively small markets from a customer base standpoint yes. so if you're talking about 25 million people total um, there's only so much your company is going to be able to grow if you're focusing on those those two markets and um, oftentimes um, you know what ends up happening with tech companies is the company that ends up being the biggest or the best is not necessarily the best product no. by yeah. any stretch of the imagination. Mm. I mean, how many products have mm. we used yeah. over the years where they've been a phenomenal product, but the company has died for whatever reason? Mm. And oftentimes that reason relates to funding and being yeah. able to scale um, against mm. somebody else that's better funded or um, has a better network than you do, mm. ultimately. Yeah. And so I think it's just really critical for these New Zealand businesses that have that potential to really be able to capitalize on that sooner versus later. And the nice thing is um, PEVCs are looking for the best companies, right. independent yeah. of geography. Mm. Mm. And New Zealand has a fantastic competitive advantage that is not talked about anywhere near as much. The fact that we're three hours time difference from the Silicon mm. Valley, that's huge. Mm. That provides so many working hours and so much overlap um, that you know, Australia with a two hour time difference on top of it really isn't anywhere near as advantageous because oftentimes mm. by the time Australia is coming online, Silicon Valley is already offline or trying to get offline. And yeah. so um, being a lot more strategic in terms of positioning what value that New Zealand operations brings um, from from a diversity standpoint is Yeah, it's is interesting because I mean we've obviously worked with a lot of tech companies and you know a bunch of them gone to the states and I think it's changing now but traditionally some of them almost tried to hide that they were from New Zealand because they saw it as a yeah. disadvantage in some of those but you're saying they actually need to be a bit more aggressive about I, I'd the be benefits. so much more aggressive because mm. the other thing too is uh, when my husband and I moved back to New Zealand um, the number of people we had in our respective networks that were trying to figure out how to get down to New Zealand, especially mm. during COVID, um, was remarkable. And they're like, okay, do I buy an investor visa? Do I try and find a company to sponsor me? Mm. Um, but the fact that you have so many fantastic tech companies here, um, there's a lot of talent that would love to be working in New Zealand. And so being mm. able to emphasize the fact that we're a New Zealand company, we have headquarters in New Zealand, if you end up working for us, or you know, if you're partnering with us, you know, we, we can create opportunities where maybe you can relocate down to New Zealand. Um, but also, I think New Zealand has this great reputation worldwide um, of, of somewhere that people really want to be or see as like their nirvana of mm. where I want to live. And so being able to promote that is a huge advantage, mm. frankly, and a, a big differentiator. Mm. That's good. Thanks. Um, so finally, yeah. <laughs> um, if we look back in your experience, uh -huh. and now, be, now you're back in New Zealand, what would you, what would be a key piece of growth advice, you know, for a Kiwi tech company, probably a SaaS company, mm -hmm. um, in relation to managing customer success or improving customer success? I think the best piece of advice I could offer is start your customer success efforts as soon as possible. I think too often people conflate support with customer success and it's a huge missed opportunity. And so I think anytime you are building out a company or trying to scale a company, really thinking through what does that customer journey need to look like? And even if it's a minimum viable product, like, you know what, we don't have the funding to hire anyone in customer mm. success. Let me build an email journey. Uh, you know, day zero, you get this email, day seven, you know, Day three, you get this one. Day seven, you get this. That in and of itself is absolutely huge versus we'll just wait for them to reach out yeah, to us yeah, and yeah. you know have that conversation after the fact. Um, the other thing too is I would focus on segmenting your customers a lot sooner. I think a lot of inclination across startups worldwide is you wanna treat all of your customers the same and you know they're all valuable, they're all really essential. The reality is the customers aren't um, equally valuable. Somebody who's going to pay you one, two thousand mm. dollars a year, they're an important customer, but they're nowhere near as important as a customer that can pay you a hundred thousand or a million dollars a year. And so creating those segregated customer experiences 
is absolutely key because it also gives your sales team the ability to talk about what is the value of spending more mm. money with us. If it's you get a dedicated customer success exec, we're going to have monthly calls with you. Mm. We're going to do specialized training. Feature requests that you have are going to get higher prioritization than somebody that's on the free or the, the lowest tier model. Mm. There's so many things that you can do to really leverage that. Um, for driving that customer engagement and that customer stickiness. And it's it's okay. I mean, how many times um, have we bought things where, you know, Netflix, for instance, you can buy the ad-supported version of Netflix or you can buy, you know, mm-hmm. the free version or the, the ad-free version of Netflix. People are going to pick what they're willing to pay mm-hmm. and what they find value in. And it's all right to cater to those different needs. Yeah. Yeah. And... Um, to really have that as, as a differentiating factor. Uh, I think the other thing too, I would say with customer success is figure out your tech stack a lot sooner than you mm. think you need to because there, the biggest issue that I've had at so many companies is the crap in, crap out problem. And so great example of this is Salesforce. Um, when Salesforce first started its product, um, none of our fields were locked down. So anyone in the company could customize any of the fields. Yeah. And so by the time I joined Salesforce, we had a problem where every single one of the fields had been customized in the product. And we were running a generation, three, four generations behind what our customers were running. And we had this massive data gap where what our customers could do with the product did not resemble anything that we could do with the product. And we had to manually brute force things because we had allowed everyone in the company to have a say over what that data strategy was going to look like. And so there was an analyst on my team who's getting paid six figures a year to calculate our monthly attrition rate. That that was his sole job. Right. Our product hypothetically <laughs> could do that yeah. because yeah. because of how we had over customized our product, mm-hmm. we actually couldn't do it in our product. And so um, the amount of resources that we had to dedicate to basically doing bare minimum business operations um, because we had backed ourselves into a corner was absolutely insane. And, you know, it would have been great to be able to push those resources to other things and to other initiatives. Um, But, you know, the other thing too with data is the more you can build out that data repository and that data Mm. approach from the get-go, the smarter you're going to be about your customers and the more you're going to see what actually works and what doesn't work. You're going to get fantastic product insights into, you know what, we think this is what our product want is X, Y, and Z feature or releases. And you get all this feedback that I hate it. Could you just roll it back because of, you know, ABC reasons, or you may find unintended use cases, or you may find new business opportunities. So like, for instance, at Salesforce, one of the biggest opportunities we had were these uh, premium levels of um, service that we Mm. could offer our customers because we had customers that said, look, if you go down, my entire business goes down. I have tens of thousands of people Mm. using this product. I will pay whatever money is required for me to have a dedicated support team. So if and when there's a network outage or you know mm. something gets pushed into production that shouldn't have gotten pushed into production, that you can figure it out. Um, yeah, that, that was completely client driven for yeah. us. Um, and yeah, we were surprised at how many companies were willing to pay for that. And all of a sudden we have this huge revenue line that mm. wasn't part of our original mm. business model. Mm. And so, yeah, I think a lot of it too is customer success is absolutely essential for driving back that feedback to yes. the product team, to the sales yeah. team, and to really be that that voice of reasoning um, across the business for what it is that you know the business needs to keep doing or not doing mm. going forward. Yeah, yeah, well, that's cool. Well, I mean, there's yeah, well, heaps of great insights there. Thanks, Naya. Well, thanks for having uh, me. Really good, really good discussion. I mean, yeah, so many things to unpack, really, but. I mean, I think a big message for me was really, you know, companies need to, they underestimate the value that there is in this customer service, customer success side of the mm-hmm. things, um, and the need to invest in that early, yep. get systems and structure around it. Um, but also, I think, I really like that story from your um, corporate executive board and General Motors, you know, having the courage to fire a logo like that because you understood that the value wasn't there mm-hmm. and um, companies being able to be in the place where they can calculate and understand that is 
is really key as well. So, mm-hmm. um, I mean, it all in, in a way it comes back to that basic of this: the customer has so many answers mm-hmm. to improving your business, and you know, the more you know about their experience with your product and things, the more you can do a better job for them. So, yeah. no, fantastic insights. Thank you very much for giving up your time. And um, is there um, how, what's the best way for people to contact you if they say, "Oh, I'd love to have a talk to Nio about." Um, you know, some of her insights or mm-hmm. some of her consulting type business? Is it through uh, LinkedIn or what's LinkedIn it? is the best way to contact me. Yeah. Um, they can also email me at nioparker at gmail.com. Okay, cool. So, perfect. Wonderful. Thanks, Nio. All right, thank you, thank you so Cheers. much. Okay, Greg, that was a pretty good interview. Fascinating stuff. Um, what do you see as the two or three key insights for our listeners? Um, well, there's a bunch there, I think. I mean, I think uh, Nio like amazing experience in some of those big big brands in the States, a lot of experience in Silicon Valley. I mean, it's great to hear her say, well, there's just a real fundamental of people underestimating customer success and, you know, investing in that post-sale. We all get, you know, it's a natural thing, I think, to get excited about adding new customers. Yeah. And that sort of drives everybody. But actually, as she's pointing out, there's so much value in, you know, working with those customers, and particularly for tech companies, SaaS businesses. Yeah. It's all about that retention. Yeah. I mean, I think for me, um, it was really my understanding of customer success a little bit. Yeah. You know, she sort of said it was not support. It's a bit mm. more holistic. She's mapped out that whole journey after the sale. And then uh, she also talked about how, you know, looking to put technology in to automate all the pieces mm. in that. Uh, so it's, quite, it's a much broader thing. Uh, you know, that was it was a real insight for me. Yeah, yeah, and then trying to build good models around, like segmenting those customers. Yeah, and you know, not treating them all as the same. You know, giving the ones that need more help and were willing to pay for it more help. Yeah, um, and just yeah, and I think you know, getting insights from customers, like she talked about that simple example with Google Ads, where they just sent the customer a statement at the end of the month. Yeah, I and mean, it sounds really basic, but it's, I bet it's something they got from talking to customers. Yeah. And it delivers heaps of value, so there's yeah, heaps, heaps there. Okay, thanks. Um, so that brings us to the end of our session today. So thanks very much for watching. Our next interview is with Tim Nichols from Proxy.